We can do our best to prepare our children for any emergency, teaching them who to call and what to say, but when something does happen, we can only hope they remember. I'm William Shatner. Tonight, true stories of families put to the test and the men and women who try to save them on Rescue 911. We begin in a suburban neighborhood of Indianapolis, Indiana. Actors have helped us reenact the events that shattered a quiet afternoon. On August 1st, as on many summer weekdays, 11-year-old Danny Troy and his 8-year-old sister Desiree were home alone. I had talked to Desiree and Daniel on the phone at about a quarter after three. And I said, um, are you behaving? And they said, yeah, Mom. Everything was fine. Both parents worked, but Georgia Troy and her husband Danny had prepared their children to take care of themselves and checked on them frequently. Me and Desiree had let some neighborhood friends into the house. We came into the front room and started to watch TV. Danny and Desiree knew they were not allowed to go outside, nor let anyone else in the house when their parents weren't at home. Yeah. Me and Paul got up and went into my mom and dad's room. Whoa! Look at this! Oh, come on! That's my dad's! Leave it alone! And Paul looked over and, and saw the guns and picked the 30-30 up. Come on, Paul! Oh, wow. All right! And he started cocking it, and he found the place, the chamber where you put the bullets, and he just started putting, loading them back in there. Put it away. Wow. me. He said, if you cock the gun twice, then I'll put it down. Come on. Daddy, put the gun down. Don't worry about it. If he is, I'm going to tell that. No, you're not. I yes, cocked the gun twice, and my friend put the bullets back in the chamber no. and set the gun down. Come on, let's get out of here. My sister's friend, he was he's about seven years old, he walked into the room and picked up the gun and started cocking it like he saw me and Paul doing. for a hole in the wall that the bullet made. Danny. But we didn't find it. Oh my God. Desiree! <laughs> when we continue. And I kept thinking, we both can't panic. If we both panic, what happens to the little girl? Are you still there? Yes, I think she's dying. When eight-year-old Desiree Troy was accidentally shot, the other kids ran home immediately, leaving her 11-year-old brother Danny alone in the house with her. Her life was in his hands. Denise Stevenson took the call. Police dispatch number three. Oh, please, please get me an ambulance. My sister's been shot. Come to 1924 South Yes. Now, listen, is that a house or an apartment? Okay, calm down. You got to talk to us. Did you say is it a house or an apartment? Um, the gun fell over and shot. Is it a house or apartment? A shot, a house. Okay, what's your name? Danny Troy the third. How old is your sister? She's crying, she's hurt bad. What's the phone number there? Two, three, six, nine, six. Are your parents home? No. Getting the call was, was particularly hard because I have children of my own. And I really felt for those parents. I was like, oh, the worst call in the world to get is something's happened to your child. Okay, I want you to stay on the phone with me. You hold on, okay? Call my mother. Call, stay on the phone with me, okay? Okay. Attention all cars, attention all cars. Report of person shot. And I wanted him to stay on the phone. So I went out on the air and got officers on the way and went back and I talked to him. He was in a situation that he just simply could not control or handle. And I kept thinking, I'm an adult. We both can't panic. If we both panic, what happens to the little girl? The gun fell and it hit his sister. Have animals en route. Okay, are you still there? Yes, I think she's dying. Okay, calm down. I want you to stay on the phone with me, okay? What is she doing? The people are on the way. I'm here. She's what? She 
walking in here. Cut. No, tell her to lay down. Lay down, Desiree. Lay down. Tell her to lay down. Stay there, Desiree. Tell her to lay down. Can you put, is she close enough where you can put the phone to her? Yes. Okay, put the phone to her ear. Okay. Oh, Please help me. Hello? The scariest part was when she's walking into the room and he's talking to her and I almost lose it. I just almost go ahead and panic. You're not there. You can't see it. You don't know how bad it is, how good it is. And emotionally, I wanted to believe she was okay. I really did want to believe that she was just grazed or barely shot and that the children were just panicking because they saw blood. Calm down. I can't. She's been shot right in the ribs. Okay, is she still laying down? I want her to lay still. Tell her she has to stay perfectly still, okay? Stay perfectly still, Desiree. Tell her it's okay. I'm getting help. Can I please call my mom? No, I want you to stay on the phone with me till someone gets there with you. We're going to get your mommy, okay? okay? Within three minutes, officers Ron Burgess and Greg Weber were on the scene. I knew that the situation was critical as soon as I opened the door and could see the little girl there lying in a pool of blood. Your heart just drops out all of a sudden. You're thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Your immediate thoughts are, I don't want her to die. What can I do to save her? Desiree was bleeding massively from multiple wounds the single bullet had made in her body. We have a female shot, approximately 10 years of age. That's extremely scary. The first thing I thought about was that uh, this little girl was going to die. She had lost a lot of color, and with the way the exit wound and the entrance wounds were, uh, you could tell that it had to damage some of the major internal organs. Officer Weber began investigating the shooting. I immediately went to Danny, and it took me two or three times to get him to hang up the phone because he was really intense talking to the dispatcher. And he directed me to the room where Desiree was shot. In the corner. It's in the bedroom. Are you the yes. only two people here? Yes. All right. His main concern wasn't answering my question. It was the fact that he wanted me to know that he didn't want his sister to die. Paramedic Supervisor Norman Hockley arrived less than five minutes after Danny placed the call. I got down and started my examination of her. I got on the radio and notified the incoming unit that this was a code 77. 54 control. Notify medic 46, I have a code 77 on a pediatric shock pants. Looking at her injuries and looking at the amount of blood she'd already lost, um, I was immediately struck by the fact that this girl should not be alive right now. I was extremely angry that uh, this child had been uh, traumatized in this fashion. Anger was then re replaced by a little fear that Desiree was going to die before we got her to the hospital. Together with the other paramedics, we placed her in the military anti-shock pants or mass pants. And uh, these pants um, prevent blood from flowing into the uh, lower extremities and keep the blood up in the chest and abdomen where they belong, uh, circulating through the vital organs. Okay. We didn't spend a lot of time on the scene. She obviously needed to be in an operating room with a surgeon as soon as possible. A neighbor called Georgia Troy at work and told her what had happened. When I first heard my daughter was shot, the, the thought that went through my mind was, oh my God, how could she be shot? I didn't, I didn't think I was going to make it. I thought, this is it. You know, she's, she's hurt. It's not something that I could ever comprehend. Not that it could be my kid. It was horrible. It's the most horrible thing I've ever felt in my whole life. I was shocked. I was stunned. I just couldn't believe that my little girl had been shot. Because you hear, like, you hear all the stories, you know, and you'd always think, no, not me, and that never happened to me. Danny and Georgia Troy went to Wishard Hospital, where pediatric surgeon Dennis Vane was treating their daughter. When she arrived at the emergency room, she was critical. Her most critical wound was a uh, wound that entered on the right side of her abdomen uh, and exited on the left side of her chest. When we took her in the operating room uh, and opened her abdomen, we were met with a rush of blood. We found a, a significant amount of destroyed tissue in there, pieces of her liver, her spleen, everything just sort of floating around in her abdomen. I assumed that it was just going to be you know, uh, kind of like in the movies, you, you've been shot, you go in, they take the bullet out, you're fine. Um, that's not the way that it turned out to be. 
The doctor came out and he told us that her, her liver was cut basically in half, that her spleen had been removed. He said, I want you to understand how serious it is, that if she does not stop bleeding, she's going to die right now, tonight. I said, I didn't care what it takes, how much it cost, what it took. I wanted him to save my little girl. The problem that we were encountering at that point is she had lost several times her blood volume uh, and all of her coagulation factors, all of the things in her blood that help her blood clot had been washed out. It became evident that we had done everything that we could in the operating room and uh, now we were in a position of trying to get her stabilized and let her own body take over and, and uh, begin to form some of these clotting factors. I went out and spoke to the parents and indicated to them that I thought her chances of survival were in the 5% range. After three hours of surgery, Desiree was rushed through a network of tunnels to a specialized pediatric intensive care unit. I asked the nurse, I said, can she hear me? Because she, she was laying there, she was all unconscious, her face was so swollen. I said, Desiree, mommy and daddy's here with you. And I grabbed her hand and her hand was ice cold. I said, I'm not leaving the hospital without you. You've got to get better. And about that time, I felt her give me a, uh, a quick little, like, you know, uh, and right then I knew that was her way of telling me that she was going to be okay. The first thing I said to her was, I love you. And in sign language, in sign language she said the same thing back. She went like this, I love you. Less than two months later, Desiree started third grade with the rest of her class. When I heard that I had been shot and my brother had saved my life, I had just wanted to get up out of that bed, run to him and hug him. Yeah. It's hard to talk about this sometimes because it just makes me remember about how many times that it's happened to other kids and they've died and I survived. Okay, baby, come on, get a strike. Come on, baby, you can do it. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Get a strike. I am the most grateful that Desiree is still alive, that she's normal. I think by all odds, she should not have made it. The fact that that bullet was definitely headed on a path to her heart and why it did not hit her heart, I don't think anybody understands. If you have a loaded gun in your house and you have children, you know, don't be stupid. Don't think that my kid would never touch that gun. Just, you know, don't think it because it's not true. It can happen to you. It happened to us. And it's going to happen probably over and over and over again until people are educated with guns. I thought I was going to die. Really, I did. I kept on pushing and pushing. I couldn't help it. Everyone was promising me these things. My grandma said, she promised that she wouldn't smoke. She said she promised she'd buy me some shoes. My mom and dad they pr said they promised to get rid of the guns. I really pushed for some of that. Mostly of what I pushed for is my life. Mm -hmm.